Hi, I'm Casey. I'm Jeremy. Welcome to our farmstead. Now that we're mostly done with the drain plumbing under the floor, we are switching gears to the rest of what needs to be done to be ready for the county's underfloor inspection. We need to get the duct in, prep the ground for the vapor barrier, and then lay the vapor barrier. Yeah, I'm going to need a few parts to finish out the plumbing, and we're short a few things for the HVAC as well, so we can make one run in all at once to finish them out. How long until the underfloor inspection so we can get the floor on? I'm thinking I'll call and schedule the inspection for Tuesday, so two days. So I'm going to switch gears, and what we're working on now is the other two, number two out of three major things that need to be done before we can get to the underfloor inspection. So um, there's obviously two major main types of um, HVAC for whole home. So ducted, there's your metal duct and your um, flex duct. In Oregon, there's a requirement now that you can only have uninsulated ductwork up to 5%. And a lot of times, essentially, I mean, that's, that's not a whole lot. And so what we're, what we're choosing is the flex duct because it comes with the insulation already attached and the price on it, especially with metal the way it is, is it's just hugely different. Now, your priorities might be different. So metal is much more efficient. You lose a lot less to friction than you do the flex duct. They've done a lot of work on the flex duct and it's gotten better. And if you install it correctly, nice and tight, then that will help as well, but you're never gonna be as efficient. So the major reason other than cost that we chose to go with the flex duct and that I prefer the flex duct for all of your branch lines, it's just that it doesn't carry noise. You know, we've we've had a couple of homes that have had metal duct installed through the whole area, and they do some things with more expensive than normal metal duct versions that I've seen. They're supposed to deaden the, the transfer of sound, but the last house we had, we were able to hear um, our kids which if you follow the branch line that went back to the main trunk line <laughs> and then to their branch lines, you know, you're talking about a hundred feet of twists and turns of ductwork. And we were still able to hear them through the ducts and they would hear each other and it would keep them up. So we just, we don't like that, that aspect. They're very noisy. The underfloor inspection is essentially um, so that the inspectors don't have to get into a crawl space or, you know, if it's a slab, then you have to inspect before you pour the slab so they can see what you've done and make sure that it's, it's good to go before you cover it. Our crawl space up until about here is head height and that's two thirds of the building. And then there is one small section that is, you know, a, a two foot space. So we talked to the county about waiting on being able to wait on putting in like the main trunk and then just running the flex duct so they could see where everything was going and the main trunk is going to be in an area with seven and a half feet of head height so they were fine with that um, we're going to go ahead and run these branch lines these supply runs and the other interesting thing about these is that you go online and you find what's called a manual J um, calculator. So what's a manual J calculator? So manual J is how HVAC technicians figure out how much air volume and how much air flow and therefore correspondingly what um, what main unit you need to run your HVAC system, as well as what the branch and supply circuits are gonna be. So I ran a manual J calculator online and it was possibly user error, but it was throwing back these huge supply circuits. I've never seen them that large. The numbers that it was putting out, just as an example, it was wanting me to run an eight inch or larger supplied flex duct to a seven by 10 utility room. So I went ahead and just did the volumetrics and then looked at what's called air changes per hour or ACH. And 
found that what the program had been set up to do was deliver 15 ACH. Now that's, if you look online, that's suggested for things like a commercial kitchen um, and you know things that require just a ton of air movement. And this, this is a residential house. So I went ahead and dropped it down to two ACH and then decided, you know what, that's a, that's a huge difference and kind of the bottom line, uh, you know, with, with comfort and everything else, uh, you know, you want to be able to deliver maybe more than that. Technically there was, um, there was, and I don't remember which, which organization it was, but there was an organization related to, um, HVAC and related to, you know, the quality of air in, in buildings and they recommended no less than 0.35 air changes per hour. So we ended up settling on four air, ACH, four air changes per hour for each room. And what that means is in the course of an hour, the volume of air in the room is, is able to be completely swapped out by the system pulling air out and then putting new air in, recycling air. So we went with, with four ACH. That's how I came up with the different sizes of flex duct. So Oregon is very restrictive. So there's not going to be a lot of heat transfer, even from just a baseline compared to, you know, your standards of comfort. And so that manual J calculator is probably based off of that lower common denominator of being able to answer that need anywhere in the nation and truly be able to provide comfort anywhere in the nation. So just something to think about when you are looking at maybe doing um, your own HVAC system, if, if that's what you're choosing to do. And I'm not going to install the main unit or the outside unit. That is the one thing left that I do intend to hire someone to do. And that part of it, you know, they really don't necessarily charge all that much for labor for that part of it. And a lot of the companies are like, sweet, I don't have to install the ducts. Yes, perfect. Um, so I'm going to get the ducts done. We did choose some of these non typical sizes instead of, you know, um, four, six, eight, we did buy a bunch of like some fives and sevens and, um, and that, that can, you know, obviously being more of a specialized size gives you exactly the supply that you need to service a room. But it also may mean that as in our case, that you're a little bit short and just in one of the big box stores of being able to pick up all your parts at one time.
we're almost ready for vapor barrier. Right now I'm working on a couple of last minute things that need done before we put the vapor barrier down for the crawl space. So this I believe is what's called a cleat. Um, these are all along the bottom of the stem wall on the interior of the foundation sitting on top of the footing. And what they do is when the panels, the forms, are up before the concrete is hardened or cast, all of these little pieces um, hold the forms in place on the bottom and they're similar ones at the top. Obviously you can't recover them. So uh, my thinking is I'm gonna hammer them down so they're flat so that they don't puncture the vapor barrier when it gets to the side of the stem wall. Today is vapor barrier day and we are getting the first run in. It's a pretty monotonous job. Um, basically, you've got to get a tape that's gonna adhere or use one of your nailer strips. Um, roll out your vapor barrier. They come in a lot of different sizes. We chose a 20 foot wide so we'd have fewer seams. However, we do have quite a bit of an interruption in the vapor barrier in the form of um, columns. So each of the columns, basically you have to, you have to seal it. Um, so the, the vapor barrier has got to come a little ways up the column, you know, over the concrete pad, and then you tape around the column. So, um, not a whole lot to show on this for the day. I'll, I'll show a little bit of what it looks like when it's done. And other than that, we just got to get through. We are almost done with our vapor barrier slide in. The biggest lesson i guess um is give yourself a lot extra and then that way when you get to places like isolated footings or um which you can kind of see down in there how they're kind of crunching let's see if i can zoom in for you so you can see how there's a lot of um twist around that isolated footing and what that is from is you've got a change in height over just one piece and so if you're going widthwise or lengthwise as you hit obstructions you want to account for that this last section here, what we're gonna do is we're gonna roll our vapor barrier out on top and give ourselves probably six or seven extra feet to 18. We're gonna go to 22, 24, 25 even. And then it's a 10 foot from here to here, the beam, and it's 20 foot wide roll. And with that slope and coming up the wall on this end and needing to overlap that barrier by two feet, which is also a requirement, we're probably going to um, cut off maybe only three feet on the outside, which also gives us a little bit of a, a length to be able to lap um, this wall here where the vapor barrier just isn't quite sufficient. You can kind of see down there, it's right up against the bottom, but it doesn't hit the, the full foot mark. And that's just the way the, the layout ended up running with the 20 foot sheets and doing two foot of overlap and hitting all those step downs. So just things to keep in mind as you're cutting yours, give yourself extra, watch out for how many interruptions and bumps you have in your vapor barrier. And um, keep in mind that you've got to hit that one foot mark up the walls if you have step downs. Our plan for our farm is to clear enough brush and small trees to let in the light needed where we can plant in fruit trees and bushes and the land looks about what you'd expect of a beautiful park. And that's kind of the sweet spot really that we're shooting for, for a canopied orchard. Um, a little bit more light will come in on this side because all of this brush on that end is gonna go away as we're at the dividing line. So now up here, we're heading into the second phase and you can see that there's some openness to it, like back in here. Um, there's also quite a bit of thick forage um, and forest, I should say, through here. So a lot of that scrubby stuff, uh, mix of salix, willow, um, ash, small maple, little bit of oak, fir, um, there's some uh, wild cherry, um, 
quite a diversity. Hazelnut, um, for one for one hillside in this area where it tends to be five or less major shrubs and trees. I mean, it's really pleasing and we are gonna try and capture that diversity with what we leave. So this is kind of a little strip here, starting here. That's gonna be in this, it's in this odd shape that's the top of the property and we kind of squared it off where we're gonna do the orchard. And this will always be like a, a, a land, a parcel of land set aside for animals and for hopefully a pond, big pond kind of right back in there. Wow, everything really looks different down there with the vapor barrier down. It definitely does. Um, hopefully uh, it doesn't get too dirty. I'll have to do some cleaning when all is said and done. Especially since the walls are open still. Yeah. Well, that hopefully won't take too much longer. We can get that closed up. What is everything ready for the inspection? What what all does needs to be done still? Um, not not nothing really. I think we're all good to go. Um, should be able to pass inspection pretty pretty easily. Nice. Um, and after that, we can sub for on. Well, that's exciting. I'm yeah. looking forward to that. Thanks for watching. See you next time.